Um, so we gave Jelly an award last night, and you were talking about how long before you started making music, when there was nothing else there for you, the music was. Can you talk about that realization that music somehow could save you early on? Yeah, I think it was, you know, it started as, this, as I tell the story about my mother and how much music affected her and it helped her with her mental health and her drug addiction and how just something would change when she would start listening to music. But then as my life progressed, I think about sometimes in my life, in my darkest moments when nobody was there for me, music was. And I'm not talking about writing music. I'm talking about listening to music. You know, long before I was really trying to write, I would, uh, you know, I think of the greatest tragedies in my life and the soundtrack to that day. It sticks with me forever. I think of some of the greatest days of my life. I remember the exact song that was playing the moment my son was born. It was Bob Dylan like a Rolling Stone. I'm not making this up. I had Bob Dylan radio on for like an hour. She had been in a long labor, and uh, he came out to like a Rolling Stone because I thought, how convenient, you know? And you named but, the son Noah instead of Dylan. Yeah, right. I blew that. I didn't get a vote. <laughs> <laughs> and then what is a song that has helped you in one of your darkest moments? Man, I could bore you with these. I, I could start as early as The Rose. Um, it was something about the Bette Midler song, The Rose, that just, it just wore all over my mother and how it, emotional it made her. It made me emotional. So even in my adulthood, I hear the rose and just instantly snot buckets, just <laughs> Michael Jordan meme crying. You put it on right now, I'd have to get up and walk out of the room. Um, and then throughout my life, you know, Bob Seger's Against the Wind is probably my favorite song of all time. James Taylor, Fire and Rain, just these songs that have just gave me big hugs throughout my life. Um, believe it or not, Kid Rock's Only God Knows Why. I just remember, the, I don't know if anybody in here was old enough to remember when he released that song in 97, but it was a moment. It was a real moment, and it was different, and it felt different, and there's been so many moments. I love songs that grow with you, you know, and I feel like that song has grown with me as I've went into fatherhood, so I, please, I'll keep rattling. I mean, thousands. Uh, the Beaches of Cheyenne by Garth Brooks, one of the greatest written songs ever. You know, you want to talk about one that'll make me cry Every single time you throw on the dance at the beaches of Cheyenne, and it'll always do it. And I just have so many records I could just reflect over my life that were like that. Let's talk about how Rump Shaker by Reps and Rex and Effect had an effect on you. All I want to do is a vroom, 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 and a zoom, zoom. <laughs> Thank you. One of y'all didn't let me look silly. Thank, I love you, and I love you, dude. And some of y'all left me hanging, and you know that song, and that was wrong. Um... That was the first cassette tape that I was given. It's funny. I had got a boom box for Christmas. I'm showing my age, but I got a boom box for Christmas. And my, my, the final gift of the day they gave me was in my stocking. I was a kid, kid. And I went and grabbed my stocking, and it was a Rex and FX rump shaker cassette tape. It just had that song and whatever the other song was that I never listened to. And five a package of, no, it was three packs back then. That's all they had. A package of three blank cassette tapes where y'all remember how we'd cheat the radio and we'd wait and we'd record our favorite song? Y'all remember that? How we, while we were smarter than the radio, dude, we'd boom, we'd catch our song early and make our own little mixtapes, cassette tapes of it. So, yeah, that was it. With CDs wasn't out yet. It was no. a big, you know, you having a cassette tape, that was a big deal. I had a boom box with a cassette tape. <laughs> that was very influential, right? Um... I'm going to get a little bit more serious. You first went to prison when you were 14, and you cycled in and out for a decade. Looking back, is there something that could have broken that cycle for you? I would like to think resources, um, rehabilitative resources, might have been able to do that. And the juvenile justice system was so focused on disciplinary action that I feel like they never actually focused the time and energy on rehabbing and trying to get, I mean, I don't care who you are, if you're a 15 or 16 year old, I have a 15 year old daughter, right? And I know what my daughter needs more than anything is connection and love. And in every scenario and in every turn and every corner, she is looking for a way to connect, be accepted, receive and give love. And when you put a kid in a disciplinary situation that involves none of that, you're setting him up for failure. And it turns into the old fashioned. If you tell somebody not to do something, the likelihood of them doing it multiplies by three. That's a like statistic. And 
I just think that maybe that could have helped, which is why we full focus all of our, and I don't want to talk about this too soon if it's in your list. It's on my list, okay. but you can, no, you can hit it now. That's yeah. fine. That's why we focus all of our philanthropic efforts on juvenile and at-risk youth and places of, I think that, you know, I believe in nurture over nature. And when you put a kid in an environment that is concrete and steel and you don't nurture them, you're allowing nature to take over nurture. And you're just only setting that revolving cycle. And I could sit here and go on a real rant about how it's incentivized, right? You know, this is the, profit. I could prison really, profit, this is yeah. a big prison for profit. I could really go on that big long rant that nobody wants to hear. But I think we need to address it different. And for me, it starts at a grassroots era that we start with our children. You know, my, I, I said this earlier. My daughter is 15. She just turned 15. And I, I'm, I'm biased. But I think she's the smartest 15-year-old I've ever seen in my whole life. I just think she's cute. She's witty. She is awesome. And then every now and then she does shit that makes me go, fuck, she's 15. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it's, and I've learned not to judge her for those 15-year-old moments. And mine was really wrong and heinous, but there's a lot of kids that have those moments that they just need to, they were looking for a way to connect. Gangs are a problem in America to this day because people are looking for a way to connect. Uh, you've put your money where your mouth is. You won't say it, so I will. So when you played Bridgestone and sold out Bridgestone, um, you donated more than $400,000 to uh, youth incarceration programs, including where you were in juvenile. Uh, and you're building studios in those juvenile facilities. There's a new facility that they're going to build that you've already committed to putting a studio in that one. What difference would that have made if you had been able to make music, even when you were in this, you know, in jail? Maybe you wouldn't have gone back as many times. Like, well, one, just imagine having the platform to find my talent and love earlier, or have uh, gasoline poured on a small flame. And I think just giving kids resources, and it's also another way of connection, right? Like you can connect in these rooms. And the studio is the beginning. I brought the studio first because. I'm a one-trick pony, and that's it. I make music. You know what I'm saying? So I was like, well, I know I can bring music. And my next goal is to try to bring in barbering and then bring in these uh, other HVAC and start partnering with local companies to help give these kids and teach them trade work and advanced GED courses. Because another thing is, when I was in juvenile, I was never forced to write. They'd make you go to school for two hours a day, but they, you know, you didn't care. It wasn't tuned in. There wasn't nobody that actually cared, and they are trying to get you across the finish line. So technically, until I got my GED when I was 24 years old in jail, jail, my last grade completed was the eighth grade. You know, even little things like if we could just institute, just that's another way to connect, though, one-on-one -on -one teachers. Putting that kid in a room where he's not around his peers, he's not being cornered, he doesn't have to put on the dog and pony show and deal with the politics of jail. Because even at 15, 16 years old, they're having a pol there's a political battle in here. There's a power struggle that makes kids not want to open up and get their GED. You get, you get looked at as, you know, one of the suckers. You're square, you know, if you want to do that, where if you put that kid in a room by himself, it's just, I could bore you with it. I'm sorry, I'm rambling, well, so much. I will say, you know, so Jelly was incredibly generous with his time, and I spent two days with him for this uh, cover story. And there's a lot in that story, you guys all have it in your seats, but there's a lot in that story that really moved me. But there's a part where you talk about getting your GED at 24, you said you had never spent more than 60 to 70 hours in high school because you spent your 15th, 16th, and 17th birthdays in jail, birthdays in jail, and you thought you were a dumbass. You thought you were learning disabled, and the quote, it's, it's still going to choke me up, is you took the test, and you passed it for the first time, and you said, I hit that bitch out of the park, and it just, I, the look of pride, the look of pride on your face, we were sitting in Witsit Chapel in a in a red cover pew and the look and see it's it's getting the look of pride on your face when you said that you could tell that 14 years later that was an incredibly transformative moment for you and so can you talk about did that put a little wind beneath your wings we're gonna get into what had happened before that and why you took your GED but how much of that was a sea change for you to realize you weren't learning disabled you weren't a dumbass well I think for me it was just the like yeah, I mean, you don't, you put a, you know, uh, what, I seen a quote one time, it's a famous quote, so whoever it is, credit them, but you, can, you can't judge a fish's ability by how good it climbs a tree. You know, and I'd never been out of my little fishbowl or my little bubble. I tell the story now that I have friends from Antioch that have never left Antioch. 
It's 18 minutes away. I'm like, yo, come to the Titan Stadium. We should go see a game. They're watching it in the trailer park. And I'm like, well, I'll take you. And they're like, no, I'm, I'm cool right here. When you live in that kind of a space, you know, I really thought I was a dumbass. I didn't think I was, I thought I was bad at talking to people. I just didn't think I had that. And it taught me a lot about myself because I told her the story in depth, but they, may, they do the test every like six months. And I came in like two weeks before the test. They said, well, you got to wait six and a half months now before you can take the test. I said, well, let me just try this one. And they was like, we'll let you try it, but, you know, whatever. And, and, and I knocked that bitch out of the park, dude. I mean, I, I mean, like crazy, crazy. And I just, at, I was, at that moment, I was like, I can figure this out. It was just the little things along the way that set extra wind in the sail. And I want to back up a little bit. You have what you call your road to Damascus moment, which is what led to you taking your GED. You were in jail. You were 23. You uh, said to me that you just thought, I'm going to die. I'm going to die young. I'm never going to get out. I'm never going to be anything. And what happened to change your path? That same little girl we talked about, that 15-year-old, is, was, was born. She was May 22nd of 2008. And I don't know what it was. I knew the girl was pregnant. It wasn't like it was a surprise baby. It's, I knew what was happening. But I just still it didn't register to me until that particular moment where I was like, oh, and, I, and I guess it's a... I don't want to intensify this, but it's a way more dramatic moment finding out you had a child born when you're in a six by eight concrete slab with a steel locked door and a steel bunk and a mattress about that thick. You know, it's just that you're already contemplating every bad, good thing you've ever done. You're constantly, back then I only knew one emotion and it was anger. I thought everything, if I was happy, I was angry. If I was, if I got too happy, I got mad. You know what I mean? But it's, um, so it made me process that. And that's the story that we jumped. I, I went straight down and signed up to go to the education unit that afternoon when they opened the door and went down there and got my GED and ended up coming home and selling mixtapes out of the trunk of the car. And I met her when she was two years old and that just kept fanning the flame. And I was just like, I just I have to figure this out for her. And, uh, I think it's because I never found a lot of worth in myself in my life at that point, but I found worth in her. And that was the moment, you know, that was it. Um, yeah, <laughs> Some of you may not know this, but Jelly Roll actually first hit Billboard's charts in 2011 as a I didn't know rapper. this neither, by the way. She told me this in her ear. I was like, really? Yes. I know. I believe your exact comment was, I need to find the distributor and get the money. Yes. <laughs> that was your exact comment. Uh, John Manili, find that fucking distributor. <laughs> I'm sorry. And you've had several albums on our rap charts. You've also had a number one on our rock mainstream uh, chart and number one on country airplay with Son of a Sinner. Does it matter to you? Is it all music to you? Or do you sit there and you think, okay, I want to write a rap song. I want to write a country song. I want to write a rock song. Or is it all just music to you? It's just music. I feel like this is going to be a hot take, but I feel like I've always wrote nothing but country songs. They were just my version of it and produced weirdly. So like, <laughs> y'all like that, right? You see the way I just slid that problem to somebody else? <laughs> I just immediately deflected. Uh, I think it was like all my songs were written just to be the truth and to tell a story. And the production is, admittedly, I'm not a music, I'm a music man. I'm not a, I'm not a trained musician. So when you start getting into the, those weeds, you start getting out of my tax bracket, you know? And that's where I kept getting lost because I didn't know, you know, I just, I was writing, it goes back to the fishbowl, right? Is that I was just writing what I could see from the fishbowl. Now, over the years, the fishbowl's gotten so much bigger, and I've seen so much more. You know, it's like the, the America's become my fishbowl, and I just, I don't know if I'm, I can't announce it, but I just uh, booked my first show out of the country for next year that will be announced soon. You'll love it. I can't wait to tell you, Melinda. You'll be oh, happy so you can't me. tell me. Okay. Yeah, you probably, you know what it is. Probably it's a big thing once a year. And, okay. Oh, but I'm going. So, okay, good. Yeah, but it's my first time leaving the country to go do music, so the fishbowl got that much bigger, dude. You know what I mean? I come back from playing a show down in Mexico, man. You might hear a little more of that Spanish guitar like Willie in the next <laughs> album, you know? <laughs> well, I want to say one of the reasons you haven't been able to do that is because of your record, you were not able to 
get a passport. You were finally able to get a passport, but other countries, America would let you out, but other countries wouldn't let you in. Yeah, Canada still, uh, New Zealand still won't let me. We had booked a debut show, in, which is in the article. I don't want to blow too much because this is a great read, but Thank you. it's, um, yeah, we've had, y'all should check it, but more than one time we've hit a wall trying to leave America after America was like, all right, we'll let you go. I was like, I fucking thought y'all wanted to get rid of me anyways. <laughs> I can't believe I had to fight for this. You know what I'm saying? God. Um, you said it's all music, but what is the difference between writing a rap song and a, and a country song? Is there a cadence? Is there some difference in... 300 words. Yeah, it's right. I mean, <laughs> That's it's the difference between a country song and a rap song. And I mean that in the most way. The cadences are different, but the rhythm and the spirit's the same. And the only difference in the cadence is the cadence is written in such a way, a double and triple time code, that you're able to get so much more of a thought off. But it's, I think there's beauty in both elements, right? I think I love being able to have the platform to tell as an elaborate of a story as I want, as wordy as I want it to be. But I also love when you can put together a tight, beautiful package that makes you feel something with less. So it's just, I think they, that's why they married a well so well together. I think that's why guys like Sam Hunt and Morgan Wallen have been so successful because of these clear hip-hop influences. It brings a different rhythm and a different feel, and it gives them a little more freedom in their storytelling, you know? But I also love it when somebody just writes one of them old stone cold 72 word make you cry country songs, you know, like Flower Shops by Ernest and um, a Bartender Blues by George Jones, right? These kind of records. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm fucking high and just talking about how much I love music. What was the question? No, I, I, I just do want to say like Jelly is a human jukebox. Like over the two days, like the songs he referenced... Backfield in motion. Yes. Backfield in motion. And you're the one who finally told I me who it was. Only because I was the person, probably the only person old enough that you'd ever talked to <laughs> who actually remembered the song. Um, you and know. more sober than my mother. Because uh, well. I've asked her a few times. She's like, I remember it too, but I don't know who sang it. <laughs> um, you know, Jim Croce, James Taylor. I mean, it was just really amazing. You're a human jukebox. Oh, like, yeah. you'd be very, very fun to do karaoke with. Oh, I'm a ball. <laughs> yeah, I'm a bla I'm a hoot to hang out with. It. I mean, I know I'm obviously a little me moment, but I'm telling you, dude, I'm a blast. <laughs> I'm not good at much, but having a good time in music, man, that's my that's my forte. And if you put music with the having a good time, I'll oh, fucking blast off. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I know, obviously, because uh, this is in the article, that uh, one of your go-to karaoke songs is Old Time Rock and Roll by oh, Bob yeah. Seger. Yeah. But what are your other go-to karaoke songs? If we're going to meet you for karaoke, what are, what songs should we better save for you? Guilty Pleasure. Here's a Guilty Pleasure one. It's Curb All the Day. Never said this. I love an old Billy Currington song at karaoke. They just sing so good, right? You know what I mean? Like a... Uh, 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 I was sitting there in a flatbed truck, <laughs> drinking on a core ground when she pulled up. But he had to be thinking this is where it next come from. That shit makes me think of my wife every time. <laughs> <laughs> I think of Bunny because I imagine she had Hollywood written on her license plate. She was lost and looking for the interstate. And that is my wife and that is my whole white trash ass. Like, come back. <laughs> Get some sweet tea. Eat a pork grind. I blew it. Let's hang out and fish. You know what I'm saying? So I'm a sucker for those kind of songs. I love any kind of old school rock song. I love the cheesy stuff that people hate to sing. Like, I will sing Wagon Wheel with you. I don't care. I think it's awesome. I will have a ball. You throw on a Whitney Houston's I Want to Dance with Somebody. That's another one of my favorite ones, too. Wow. That I want to see. Yo, it's awesome. We in my... Uh, I don't want to... Well, fuck it. I'll spoil it. I'm sorry. If you ever come to a Jelly concert, don't be mad. But when I walk off stage... The loudest they can play it in the arena, I make them play dance with somebody when they turn the lights on. So you just instantly, like, you get this, like, love feeling at the end of it. Ooh, I want to dance with somebody. I want to feel the heat with somebody. And everybody's just dancing out there still. It's so cool to watch. I'm sitting backstage like a weirdo peeping out the curtain, just watching people have a party, you know? See, we used to mess up and play Lil John, and fights would happen. So I was like, hold on. <laughs> I think uh, I think I can speak for all of us that we're really gonna need a Whitney a Hughes, uh, cover of "I Want to Dance." With oh, somebody. stop it! I am in, dude. We're really gonna need that. Um, when you were accepting your award last night, you talked about how your dad talked about luck mm. and what uh, how important luck is. 
what percentage of your success is talent, what percentage is hard work, and what percentage is luck? Oh, I love your questions. I hate you for them sometimes, though. <laughs> Shit. That is so good. This is going to be a hot take. I have a lot of those by default. I'm probably 60%, 55% maybe hard work, maybe 15% talent I don't have a lot of talent right I've worked the talent I've got I've worked at but I hope that encourages somebody that I didn't naturally sing I had to find this voice and spend thousands of hours figuring I still don't fucking know what it can do I'm figuring it out daily it's I'm learning new stuff and I would say about 25 percent was just pure absolute luck just perfect timing but I also think I shoveled shit for 30 years and I turned my heart, and when my heart changed, it's like God was like, just been waiting on you, big fella, and started repaying me all that bad luck I had. And every now and then, I'll still get an old curveball thrown and hit me in the nose. But ultimately, that luck is, I, how lucky am I that John Loba is the president of Broken Bow Records when I'm finally shopping a deal? How lucky am I that John Manili is open to having another client on his roster after 17 years with fucking Jay-Z? How, how lucky am I that Hunter Williams is a Nashville kid at CAA that loves me because I'm a Nashville kid. Like, I can just point all these little instances. How lucky am I that Hardy is on fire right now? And because guys like Hardy are so left of center, it allows guys like, guys like Tyler Childers are out right now. Guys like Sturgill Simpson are on the scene right now. So there's so much variety in music, and especially in the genre of country music right now, how lucky am I that I got to fit in that little crack and crevice? How lucky am I that Garth Brooks thinks I'm cool? That's my name drop of the day. It's my name drop of the day. It's the biggest one of the day. Like, how lucky am I that I would be in that era where people are open to talking about feelings and mental health and a man sitting on stage and crying about his daughter is okay. How lucky am I to be in this particular moment that my music can be here? Ten years before this, I was fucked. Ten years later, I might still be, but God gave, that's that 25%, Melinda. Right in this window, I am cool cruising, baby. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Cool Cruising Baby is a song. Cool Cruising. If you give me another song title, I'm going to have to give you publishing. You're going to quit writing, I, I quit would, writing I for Billboard and be a songwriter a in town. More. Yeah, Cool Cruising <laughs> Baby. Melinda gives me a, 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 probably three or four titles every time I'm around her. I'll say something. <laughs> she'll be like, that's a song. I'm like, it is a song. Just grab Jesse Joe Dillon backstage, convince exactly. her to write songs with me. Well, speaking of, so you're talking to Nicole Gallian backstage, and she is saying that Witch Chapel is her new favorite album. You, she has listened to it, you know, front and back and absolutely loves it. What does that mean to you to have one of the best songwriters in the world, not just in Nashville, say that to you? Oh, it's unreal, man. It's one, I'm a little kid that's bashful because I wrote on the album. So I'm like, she likes my songwriting. <laughs> I was, but I didn't want to, but I want to act like, and then I was like, I want to tell her I want to write a song with her, but I don't want to be that guy. Because I hate it when people are like, we should do the thing. And I was so nervous. I looked at her and said, we should do the thing. And I was like, <laughs> Shit. I blew it, and I grabbed Jesse. I was like, she said we could do the thing, but I was weird. Can you please make it happen? And Jesse Joe was like, I got you. I was like, okay, thank you. <laughs> but no, it was really cool, man. I'm just such a fan of the song. This last panel, y'all were the same group. Y'all were here for the panel before this. They, uh, songwriters are the absolute heartbeat of this town. You know what I mean? For sure. They're the backbone of this town. They are. And I'm honored to be one of the artists in town that identifies as a songwriter. Like, I look at myself as a, like, if you don't know who I am, or we're in a grocery store, and you just, you're a talkative like me, and you're like, wow, well, you're, what do you do for a living? Because we're waiting to check out our cherries. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, 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 I would look at you and I would say, I'm a songwriter. And then if you were like, oh, great, do you sing too? And then I'd be like, yeah, of course, I, you know, but I first gun to head right now, you got one answer, what do you do for a living? Songwriter. So that's what you identify as a songwriter. I identify as a songwriter, yeah. Um, how are you not bitter about what happened to you? Can I say this about songwriting first, Melinda? Uh -huh. Because I'm <laughs> confident. I'm so excited about songwriting. I'm <laughs> confident that I'll do that until I die. I'm not sure that I'll perform 
the rest of my life. I watched Willie get on stage at 90 years old the other day. It was awesome. He walked up the steps without touching a fucking rail. He walked straight up the steps. I'm not bullshitting, y'all. Listen, my mama's 72 in a wheelchair and don't remember anything. This dude's 90, walked up a set of steps, took straight over, sat on a bar stool, picked up Trigger. His guitar. I expected a little pop for Trigger. Come on now. So he's had the same guitar for like 60 years, 50 years or something. He picks it up, and for one hour and 10 minutes, he just sings. One song Lucas Nelson sang without him. One song, and it was impressive. But in that moment, I thought, no way I'm doing that. Absolutely <laughs> not happening. I admire him. I'll never do it. But I do know that, you know, guys my size don't live to be 90, but if I break the code, I'll be writing songs. That's good to know, because we'll be wanting to hear them. Um, but so, yeah, how did you get over being bitter? You, you've taken a lot of responsibility, well, total responsibility for your past. But is there a part of you that's still bitter? That, you know, there wasn't a jelly roll who was building a studio in the prison to, to help you? No, I don't think I'm bitter about it. I think I'm actually, I think that I'm glad it happened that way, because I can help kind of control the narrative now. I can help bring actual understanding to what that situation needs. And I can be hopefully a, a guidepost of success coming out of that. But I also think it don't make me bitter because man, I was, I was, there's an old quote and I know it's cliche, but you know, we either get bitter or we get better. Um, there's another one that says, we don't, we don't lose. We learn, you know? And to me, like I learned so much from that and I developed so much of a personality and I came through that on the other side of it, just, so clean that I almost look back at that less bitter and more compassionate because I'm compassionate for me and the people that are in that situation. The thing that makes me bitter is not everybody from where I'm from changed. And there's a lot of bitterness about that. And you can't help everybody. Somebody once told me, you know, this is a good quote. You can do anything, but you can't do everything. And that was a big thing for me. And I'm having the, the, the problem I deal with is coming to peace with that, is that my heart still hurts for who all I can't help. You know, not just, I wish I could focus more on who I can. Would that kid in jail have ever dreamt that he would be writing songs on an album called Wits at Chapel with Miranda Lambert and Ashley McBride? No. Not at all. Never would have thought that dream was too small. I, and I'm, I say it all the time now is I encourage people to dream bigger because I remember a time, I got emotional on the stage last night with y'all, Melinda, because I remember a time where this was like, this was the Mecca. Like if you came to this room and you could play it, like you, were to, you could get to the Ryman. This was the path to the Ryman Auditorium. This was it. And I knew that because I'm a local guy. I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. I was born and raised here. And so I played this little spot, beautiful place called Exit Inn. It's right down the street from here. It's an old school rock and roll club. I see some people that were like, y'all, we know about Exit Inn. This looks like y'all stumbled out of there. It's a great spot, but it holds 500 people, and you have to sell it out before you can come here. Three times I booked that place and couldn't sell it out. Wow. Three times I booked it. I think the last time I got close enough that they gave it to me, and then I had a couple of things hit, and they let me come to this room. And there was, a, I remember walking in my back door, th in the back door of this thinking, if they never let me do it again, dude, we did it tonight, y'all. We did it, baby. We made it to Music Marathon. And it sold out. And I was like, you know, and that was my kind of way to the Ryman Auditorium. So you look back now, and now I'm just in here speaking on a panel that Garth Brooks spoke on with Billboard uh, Country Live celebrating, the, I'm celebrating for sure, the fact that I was on the cover of Billboard <laughs> magazine this month. So this is just all, I can't wrap my head around any of it. You know, I remember listening to the house that built me and just weeping, thinking about my childhood home. You know what I mean? Hell, I did the same. I did what all rappers do when I got rich. I tried to buy my childhood home and it made me think about the house that built me again. And then to be sitting there with Miranda Lambert and she's such a badass, y'all. She's the best human ever. She, I can count on her being the first text to congratulate me on anything. And, um, yeah, this is all unreal. Now Now that I've learned that my dreams then were too small, I'm dreaming properly now. So were you able to buy the house? Nope, wouldn't sell it to me. The owner just flat to offered him a gang of money. He said no, but he told me that if he ever sold, he wouldn't call nobody else. Okay, so he's not selling it to somebody yeah. else. I respect where he was with it, though. He was like, look, man, I'm, I plan on dying here. I was like, no problem. 
<laughs> Could you make it soon? <laughs> yeah, 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 just hurry up. Yeah. <laughs> um, you don't mind me asking, how old are you and what kind of shape are you in? <laughs> um, have you been surprised by how quickly Nashville has accepted you? It's not always that open a town. I mean, I know you grew up here, but Antioch could have been a million miles away. I want to say this with, with respect, and it might come off disrespectful. I've always known what Nashville thought about me. I didn't know what Music Row thought about me. Nashville has been with me from go. I mean, you know, from the exit end to the end, to the marathon, to the Ryman, this town, man, the people that run this city, the real people that run this city, the valet parkers, the cooks, the chefs, the service workers, the waitresses, the bartenders, the fucking Uber drivers, the Uber Eats drivers, they love Jelly Roll. That is my <laughs> people. You know what I'm saying for sure? That is my people. Now, I never thought, thank y'all. I take pride in that, by the way. It means a lot to me, man. Um, I hope that my music helps a guy on a yacht, but it means a whole lot more when it does it to a bartender at a little bar in Antioch. You know what I mean? <laughs> It's a little different, you know, but um, I never knew what Music Row would think of me, and I always hated them because I thought they hated me, and then I went to meetings, and I found out that they didn't hate me. They just didn't think I would ever make it in country music, and I was pitching it hard, and they would be like, have you talked to our sister company in Los Angeles, and I was like, yeah, and I don't like them because they can't introduce me to Tim McGraw. I want to <laughs> do something here. You know what I'm saying? I was like, I want to do, I'm from Nashville. I want to do something here. And every label in town politely was like, we think you're going to go on to do great things. You should just do it with Charlie Puth. And I was like, I think I should do it with Ashley McBride. You know, and they were just, I just had a different vision. And, and uh, lucky for me, Jonathan Loba and Joe Jamie, Adrian Beatball Michaels and the Stony Creek Records family believed in it. Country radio did not hesitate. If we had to put a scale like we did about my talent up, that talked about country radio's support for Jelly Roll against non-support, it's like 95-5. It would be a blowout in any popular vote in America. I will say fuck that 5%. But that 95 <laughs> <laughs> sorry y'all sorry um you're running so hard right now like you were everywhere you know you were in good morning going to good morning america on friday you're playing with tanya tucker on sunday you were you know playing darius's uh benefit on uh monday how are you dealing with the pressure and how do you take care of your mental health when you are getting pulled in eight million different directions I make time for me every night. No matter what, there's a thing. I do a thing that's my thing, and people are going to laugh at it, but it's my thing. I play video games for about an hour every day. No matter what's happening in my life, this is my me hour. And sometimes I'll play with friends. Sometimes I won't, but I take the, I, I make it, I prioritize me. A little bit of me time. There's 24 hours in a day, everybody. We should be able to make a little bit of me time for us. Something you love to do, I encourage you. It helps with mental health so much. Um, a walk outside, I hate that. I hate it. When my therapist, she'd be like, just go take a walk. I'd be like, I don't want to walk. Look at me. I don't want to walk. But it's funny how a walk will reset your, your chemistry. You know what I mean? You'll be like, oh, this is all right. I kind of needed this. I take that serious, and I plan days to rest. I think I told you the story when I came home from Good Morning America Friday. I'm a weirdo. Because of being incarcerated, I wear socks. Until right before I go to sleep, I take my socks off. And I put them right back on as soon as I get out of the shower in the morning. I'm weird about walking around barefooted. And I said, I don't want to put socks on all day Saturday. And I did not put on socks all day. I slept for like 18 hours. I only woke up to eat. I live like a grizzly bear. I literally <laughs> woke up, ate like nuts and berries and shit, and went right back to sleep. And I did that all day Sunday. So I make sure to, you know, I listen to my body and, and I, I call family. I make it a point to call one of my siblings every single day. A brother, or sister, cousin, niece, nephew, just somebody that doesn't give a shit what Jelly Roll's doing, that just wants to talk about what they're doing. Because that's something else. As an artist, believe it or not, I want to hear what you're going through. You know what I mean? Because you know what the fuck I'm doing. you just seen it. I was on Good Morning America. It was a blast. It was everything you think it was. It was incredible. It was so awesome. We went and ate pizza afterwards, and I, I'll never forget it. Now, what are you doing? You know what I'm saying? You know. <laughs> um. You're, like you just mentioned, you're in therapy. You're very open about being in therapy. 
What's the biggest discovery you've made about yourself? I've learned things that triggered me that I didn't understand. This is a really personal story, but one day my wife was, was going through something, and when my wife goes through stuff, her instinct is to back away, not from me, but from everything, and just reassess. Because of my mother's addictions and struggles, when she would back away, the kid in me would want to go, whoa, what can I do to help, right? And it's that that's a trigger for me, right? Did I do something wrong? You know what I mean? And I learned that early in therapy, and I realized, fuck, I've started 30 arguments with my wife just because we didn't understand. I didn't understand. Now I understand. This has absolutely nothing to do with me. I love you, girl. You're going through something, sweet lady. I'll be upstairs. Call me if you want to chat. If not, holla back. You know what I'm saying? Because I, I know how she deals with things, and I know how not to let what I, I, I was so selfishly making it about me. Right. You know, she goes through something. I'm like, what did I do? How do I insert myself in this? You know, and it was it wasn't malicious. It was a trigger from things that I had went through in my childhood that I didn't even realize until it got brought to the floor. Because I was like, yo, I'm kind of annoying to my wife sometimes and I don't want to be this way. And he was like, well, tell me about this. And then we got to it. And now it's like things happen in my life. And more often than not, before I react, I can catch triggers now and go, hold on now, dude, that's. That's that 13-year-old kid in you trying to get in his head right now, man. Just sit back down, dude. The world's, you didn't say something stupid to Luke Bryan. You're going to be okay. Because I'm on the bus like, did I fuck up? I said something crazy to Luke, didn't I? Do you think Luke liked me after that? And I'm like, you're just being weird, dude. Stop it. And I get those <laughs> triggers now. And then Luke texts me like, love you, dude. So cool to see you. I'm like, I knew it. I knew it. So it's like those things. And that's the stuff that helps me. I've learned those. And identifying them now saves me so much trouble. Well, I, you spoke about your mom and her addiction, and I think one of the most affecting songs um, on the album is called She, and it's about your mom's addiction, but when we talked about it, you said it's not just about your mom's addiction, it was about your daughter's uh, mother's addiction, like it was about your sister's addiction. Uh, can you talk about how addiction, and you speak very frankly about fentanyl and the fentanyl problem, how addiction has impacted you? Well, I've, I didn't realize... You know, so many people dealt with addiction in my life from early that it just became so normal that it took me getting out of it to see it from the 30,000-foot view. And then it just broke my heart because when it had things isolated are never a problem. My mentor, Troy Probst, taught me this. Isolated, nothing is a problem. So the idea is, hey, I had a friend overdose and die. That's, 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 that's sad. The next time a friend overdoses and dies, you're like, oh, man, I had a friend. It's isolated. And then one day you look back and go, man, I've lost like 13 people, Thir probably 30, but 13 to 15 of them, 20 of them, 20. I can't. I, I, the gun, gunshots, drug overdose. I've had maybe one person I love die in a car crash. It's always gunshots, but mostly overdoses. And then you look back at that long line, and then I started doing the history and uh, me and my manager started looking at, like, national statistics. And last year, I think it was 11 or 14 people an hour overdosed and died every hour on the hour, 24 hours a day right here in America. And what I'm fixing to say is going to piss somebody off, but they need to hear it. If 11 brown, fluffy-tailed squirrels were dying an hour in Central Park. It wouldn't happen for three days before the city of New York would shut down and try to figure out what the fuck was killing the squirrels. So I guess I'm a little not understanding of how, once again, isolated is nothing but a problem. That's a personal problem. You do better. You, should have, you shouldn't have did drugs. You knew what you were doing. Almost like these drug addicts, there's people that believe they deserve to die. You made your bed. You lay in it. And that's just not what we've learned about mental health and about addiction, period, and that it's actually an actual addiction an actual disease. This is something that's uncontrolled. That this person, you don't know what's in this person. It's not in every person. It's like every other disease. It's like a cancer. You don't know what's going to feed it to this person or the next. You don't understand that, that, that I can go out tonight, drink a little bit, do some cocaine and wake up and feel great. And it might affect you in a totally different way and send you on a different spiral the rest of your life. And that's something that, you, that takes real time and we need to focus more resources on that. And I just wanted to bring attention to it because 
you can, it's easy. And I'm also a stoner. I'm a very public proponent of thinking the state of Tennessee needs to legalize weed. I'm very open about this because weed helped me get off prescription pills. And now it's sad to me that I can go to a doctor in this town right now and get prescribed 90 Percocet 30s faster than I can or, and, and feel more comfortable with it in my car than I can the quarter ounce of fucking weed I have in my car right now. It's just, it's fucking wild. You know what I mean? It's insane to me. And I mean, little things, I'm sure by statistics, somebody in here is going to know the person I'm talking of. Somebody you know, one person in here knows this human. Somebody you know went through something in life, really got hurt, was over-prescribed pain pills, and became a different person. It wasn't. It was a real thing, though. Something happened to them. They really hurt themselves. They needed pain management and pain relief, and they ended up walking out of it with a full-blown drug addiction. And this is the beginning of it. In the fentanyl epidemic in America, this is blowing the crack p- epidemic out of the water, and we're just not even taking it serious. You think about how we did. We created the whole war on drugs behind fucking psychedelics, but we've allowed fentanyl to just come in and kill 12, 15, 16 people an hour, every single hour. And we're just like, yeah, they'll figure it out. We got to do something. And my part as a musician is, I I don't talk about politics. This is the most I'll ever talk about politics. My job as a musician is to write it in a song because that's what I do. I don't always get to do a panel where I get to go in depth about what I believe we should do about the pain pill problem in America. But I can write a song and at least try to bring a little attention to the fact that it's actually happening and it's actually fucking up America. Um, thank you. That was very impassioned. Um, we're, we're supposed to end, but we're going to, I'm executive editor and I can make an executive call. I'm hanging. We're going to go a little bit longer because it's the last panel of the day. We won't go too long, folks, back there in the control room, but we're going to go a little bit longer. Um, one of my favorites on Wits Chapel is Naomi, which is about the hypocrisy of uh, so-called Christians. Um, what's been your experience with that? You know, I feel like that for too long in the world, we've allowed the few to speak for the many and that the many here aren't speaking enough for the few. And I think that Nail Me was another example of that, of like by some of the Christian antics that I see online, it makes me embarrassed to have this cross tattooed on my face. It is disgusting the way the church treats people. It is disgusting the way church looks at certain things. It it makes me sick sometimes to have this tattooed on my face. And then to have those people in that position be be sick of me having this tattooed on my face equals the equal tension there, right? And to me, Naomi was kind of more in that vein of like, Look, I found my way through spirituality under the understanding of who we were is not who we are and that we can always be better than we are right now, right? That's what I found the spiritual principles to change my life was this hope and actual redemption that people can actually change. That literally, if it's just something as small as you want to quit hitting that vape pen, you can do that. Like you can change, like you can can make changes in your life. I don't understand. These other people use it as a as a soapbox to stand on and judge people. And I was like, well, this is a perfect time to address that because, listen, man, I've read the four Gospels that were, where Jesus is quoted a lot. I, was, I had a lot more time than a lot of people to read it for what it's worth. I mean, I read it a lot. And I can tell you that nothing about the way the church acts, not the church as a whole, but the few that speak for the many, the one that you see, is a representation of what Jesus was actually like in the Bible. Whether you believe he was born again and resurrected, whether you believe in any of that, put that to the side. The historic figure of Jesus was a gangster. He was awesome. He rode around with 12 thugs. He made them go in pairs. He turned water into wine and did party favors. He flipped tables over at fucking churches and said, quit selling shit here. I'm serious. This is the Jesus that's in the Bible, right? He protected prostitutes. He stood up for town whores. He told Pharisees to get away from me. You're sinning too. Move on. He, he covered adulterers. He fed homeless people. He visited people in jail, and they killed him. Brother, you believe he came to life after that? That's all historical and real, right? Where in the shit out of that story do you get you're supposed to judge me? He did nothing but protect the people that were judged. (laughs) 
And if I'm, he was here today, he'd have pulled up on a Harley with 12 dudes behind him <laughs> with long hair and beards. I hate to blow your opinion, but he wasn't really cute. He had a crooked nose. He looked like every Jewish person from that area in that time. It's just look him up. You'll see what he really looked like. He was They would look like gangsters. They would look like carpet laymen coming in here just fucking like, what's up? It'd be awesome. You know what I'm saying? And ladies and gentlemen, that's the gospel according to Jelly Roll. Welcome to Witsa Chapel. <laughs> um, my, uh, my last question to you is, uh, when you were in prison, you've talked a lot about how you were, um, you were a less than desirable person. You were a bad guy, are your words. Do you think you're a good guy now? I think I'm a great guy. I think I'm a great guy. <laughs> I'll be honest. And I'll be honest, man, I'm proud of myself for saying that because it took me a long time to feel that way. It took me a long time to start getting a sense of pride. You know, it took a long time to, uh, I never have to worry about getting an ego because I just still struggle with this thing, period. It's like, I'm really proud of the person that I'm becoming. I, I'm most proud that no matter how good I think I am or great I think I am now, that God's not done with me yet. I'm just beginning. You know what I'm saying? I'll figure that I have so much more room to grow. I'm just learning how to sing. I'm just finding my voice. I'm just learning the guitar. My best days are in front of me, not behind me. That's why I focus on the rear view. I mean, I focus on the windshield, not the rear view. Uh, there's a famous song. There's a famous a lyric in a song on went number one at Country Radio, by the way, from this guy named Jelly Roll. And it said, <laughs> and the lyric said, I pulled the rear view off of this old Ford, so I only see in front of me. And that's where we are now, man. Now, I do have a problem with uh, the pass running up beside me every now and then. I got hit with a baseball bat. Get back, Satan! <laughs> but other than that, I just, you know, I'm still pushing, man. It's, I think my best days are still in front of me. And more than anything, I just want to do right by people and put out music that makes people feel the way music still makes me feel. Um, my last question to you is, you know, you have sold out Bridgestone. He played her last night, in case you didn't get that from when he was talking about Marathon. And the audience was mesmerized. I don't know if any of you guys were here. Um, but, oh, good. So you saw. So I'm, you know, standing up there looking over the, your shoulder at the crowd, and I'm thinking, there's no telling how big this is going to get. In your mind, how big is this going to get? What is your biggest dream? Man, I, so I believe in life looking like focus on the mountain in front of you. I haven't thought of it as a five or 10 year thing just cause I haven't, I don't know, I don't, but I know that my dream was to always play my hometown arena and I was able to do that last year and sell it out. Um, that what I'm fixing to say is gonna sound absurd and I know how crazy, but I learned early that I was dreaming too small so now if I sound crazy, just know I could be right. I wanna play Nissan Stadium. I wanna play Nissan Stadium. I want to do a show in Madison Square Garden. I want to go to New York City and do it in Madison Square. I want to play the uh, Forum or the Staples Center, whatever they've named it now. You know, I, I want to go hit those landmarks. And, and, and um, you know, a shameless plug here. We're, we are, uh, I've seen the chart data this week. We are really close to having a top four album come Friday. So if you want to stream it when you leave, it'll help me a lot. That's a, that's a big one. <laughs> Tell a friend. But, yeah, um, I want to win a Grammy. I want to win a CMA. That's what I want. I, I, I've, I went to the CMTs, and I had the, one of the greatest nights of my life. I went three for three. I won all three awards. Yeah, thank you. I was crazy. I don't know if you've seen it. It was awesome. It was the, one of the greatest nights of my life. It was the high school prom and graduation I never had and won. It was just great. Um, valedictorian shit. It was just awesome. And, but that was a fan-voted thing, and I always knew the fans had my back. Um, I'll never forget the quote that Garth Brooks said you told him the night of one in Vegas when you looked at him and said, they've always showed up for you. And I thought about that to me, like these people have always showed up for me. Even when it wasn't a lot, people showed up. They've always showed up for me. So it would be cool to get the respect of the critics and my, my peers next. So I think the billboard cover was the beginning of opening that floodgate. And I, and I hope to get to the Grammys and the CMAs now and, and I get respected in the community. Because one thing I know for sure, I hope they accept me. But if they don't, fuck it. I always got the fans, baby. 